Hey guys, it's Miss Batty here. And as you will probably see from the screen, we are starting with our chemical reaction lessons today. Now you might notice that this first lesson is actually a review. And that's because before school closed, we were about halfway through our unit. So I don't want us to, to restart from the beginning. You guys have learned so much, um, but I do want to take a moment for us to think about what we had learned, what evidence we collected. And right before the closure, we also were just about to identify what that brown substance in the water was. So we're gonna talk about that today and what the rest of this unit will look like. I so wish that we could be together to learn this, um, but I hope that you'll be able to collect some evidence and, and figure out some cool things about chemical reactions in this unit. So what you're going to need for this lesson today um, is a pencil or pen, maybe some lined or blank paper, just so that you can jot down some notes um, and, and kind of have this review um, notes with you as we go through the unit. Something that's optional, but if you have available, would be um, maybe you'd like to open up the chemical reactions digital model in Amplify uh, so that you can check back in there as we go through our review. And then also, as I always recommend, that you find somebody to check in with. So can you message a friend through Schoology or text or, or get on the phone? Um, or maybe there's somebody around the house that you can talk and check in with just to, to make this a little bit more interactive and to get to share your ideas about this with someone else. So to remind you of where we all started, we have been focusing on how chemistry plays a role in keeping our water safe. At the beginning of the unit, we watched a video um, to see how water chemists test and ensure that the water we drink and bathe in is safe for us. Water has to be treated before it's safe to drink. And scientists are doing the work every day to make sure that our water is safe. So at the beginning of the unit, we looked at some different water samples and a couple of them were clear. There was one that was this darker color. It looked like it had some mud in it. And right away we knew that this muddy, weird brown looking water was probably not safe for us. But we also started to consider that maybe there are things in even clear water that might not be safe for us to drink. And so we started to think about what kinds of things might be in water? How are we able to tell this? What makes it safe or not? And then we came to realize that this was actually happening in a town called Westfield. So we were introduced to this problem that we are going to be helping to investigate and understand over this unit. The residents of Westfield were finding a reddish brown substance coming out of their water pipes. And we agreed pretty quickly that that probably is not something that you wanna be drinking. Um, so the, here's the neighborhood right here. And to remind you, there was brown water coming out of their faucets in their household. However, they also took samples from some other places. This town of Westfield is getting their water from a well. And they took a sample from the well and found that it actually was clear in the well, but brown in the homes. And I have the samples here um, to remind you. So here's our well water, right? This looks pretty similar um, to the water that's in my, uh, my hydro flask right now. Um, and then here is a sample from the, the pipes, the, the, the water that's coming out of the home, right? So these look very, very different. There's one that is clearly not probably safe to drink. Um, we're not really sure about the well water. It looks like typical drinking water, um, but many of you realized that that might not actually mean that it's safe to drink. And so we also um, saw that there was some fertilizer coming from the nearby farm. And so we were able to look at some samples of those as well. And so here I have um, my sample of the fertilizer. Um, if you remember, it was white. It was kind of these small pellet-sized kind of material. Lots of us noticed that it made 
kind of a sound in the container. It's not leaving too much of a residue. Um, a little bit, you can see it's been kind of cloudy. Our brown substance um, is here. And so as you can see, this is kind of a reddish brown. Um, it's leaving some residue on the container. Um, when I shake it, I'm not really hearing any noise that it's making when it interacts with the container. Um, and so this is dried brown sample uh, from the water that's coming out of the pipes. And finally, we also have um, here a sample of shavings from the pipe. And so we were able to see it's kind of this brown, um, they're kind of flaky looking pieces um, and makes a little bit of a sound when you shake it. It's leaving a little bit of a residue on the container. Um, so we have these samples from Westfield and that is where we started our investigations. Now, immediately a lot of my students had different ideas about what could be going on with Westfield. Um, here were some of their thoughts that maybe this brown substance, it, it reminded people of kind of mud or dirt. And maybe because as we can see in this last picture, um, oops, that the well is kind of above ground, it's open. Maybe there is some um, dirt or mud that's getting into the, the well water. There was also thought that the brown substance is pieces of the pipe being dissolved in the water. So the pipe and the brown substance shared um, some characteristics and properties. Uh, some people thought that the brown substance was a combination of the fertilizer in the pipes so that there was some kind of thing happening um, when they mixed together. The brown substance was actually just the fertilizer that has been dissolved and maybe changed color. Um, and then there were some ideas that the brown substance was rust from the pipes. But we weren't really, when I, when I asked what this was, um, we weren't exactly sure where this rust comes from. We're thinking maybe it has something to do with maybe water and the pipes, maybe um, it's dissolving them. And so right away, we, we knew a couple of things could not be true. So the first is that um, we know that the well water, to remind us, is actually clear. And so it's very unlikely that something is contaminating uh, the well. It doesn't seem that there's dust or mud or something getting into the well water because we do see that the well is clear. The brown substance is happening in the homes of Westfield. So it seems to be something that is occurring along this pathway. Um, and so we started to collect evidence about how to figure out what could be going on in this water. Now, after looking at uh, the different substances and, and their properties, we realized pretty quickly um, that these three substances seem to be different. The fertilizer is clearly very, very different um, than the brown substance. The pipe and the brown substance look more similar, um, but they do still share um, or they, sorry, they do still have some different properties. And so right away, we kind of had this discussion that each substance has its own unique set of properties and different substances are going to have different properties. So it seemed unlikely that the brown substance was just the pipe or the fertilizer. It seems like this might be something else um, because they are having these different properties. Now, in our investigations, we did also see that we could have some substances that had very similar properties. So from just looking at these substances, they look almost identical. They're both white crystalline substances. Um, they look very, very similar, but they do actually have some different properties that you have to run additional tests on. Um, over here as well, we've got these clear, transparent liquids. They are different, um, but just from looking at them, you might notice that they do share some properties. So yes, substances do have their own unique set of properties, but sometimes some of those properties overlap. And so we started to think about well, is there a way then for us without having to run all of these different tests and test 
all of their properties for us to be able to know whether these are the same substance or not. And to do that, we turned at to the digital model. And so here would be a great time if you would like to get back on the digital model and, and see what you can do. Um, here would be a great time to pause the video and open up that chemical reactions digital model. And uh, we wanna be in the chemical stock room. And so what you're looking for there is just to make observations about the different types of chemicals that you can find there um, and what are you noticing about them. So I want you to pause the video no matter what um, and take a moment to, to think about or discuss with someone, why are we using this digital model? Why is it allowing us to see these substances in a different way? So as you might have discussed or, or thought about, the digital model is allowing us to see these substances at the atomic or the molecular scale. So what I mean by that is what we can see when we look around, that is all the macroscopic scale. We can see it with our eyes, we can make these observations. But we found out that the things that make up these materials or substances are actually very, very, very small. They are made up of something called atoms or molecules. And so we realize that if we're wanting to, to look deeper at, at the atomic and molecular scale, we are going to have to use a digital model because unfortunately, um, most of our schools, actually none of our schools have these really, really expensive, sophisticated electron microscopes um, that would maybe allow us to see it otherwise. And so one thing that we did discuss at this point was in our previous unit of phase change, we had been drawing molecules as circles, as these um, circles, and, and we showed how they moved with arrows or, or other kind of lines. But in this unit, we realized that actually there's a little bit more to um, molecules. Molecules are actually multiple atoms together. So when we're drawing that circle, um, what we really are actually meaning is an atom. That's the smallest, um, tiniest subunit of matter. And when two or more of these atoms come together, we call it a molecule. Um, and they can be very, very small, so maybe just two atoms together, or very big. Now, there's a star next to this very big um, because, as we saw in the video, when I'm talking about molecules being very big, I'm meaning that there are many, many atoms together. Not that the molecules are actually large in size because, as we know, molecules are very, 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 very tiny. Um, if I open up this... Uh, link here, this learngeneticsutah.edu um, content cells and scale. I'll leave the link here for a second if you'd like to pause and go yourself. Um, we can see just how small these atoms and molecules are. So here's that uh, coffee bean, right? So that's, that's pretty small, maybe about this big. Um, and it's showing us that this is inside of a coffee bean if we are keeping this scale, a sesame seed would be this much of the, the coffee bean. Now, if we zoom in even further, right, we have our grain of salt, and that's at 0.5 millimeters. Then we keep going, and oh, we are almost at a skin cell, right? And so think about how much we're zooming in and in. We started at a coffee bean, which is already very small, and we've zoomed way in, and we're at a skin cell. Now, we're not even at the point of atoms and molecules yet, right? If you notice, now we're at a bacteria, which is so, so tiny. We keep going. We're at a virus, the measles virus, the influenza virus, even smaller, um, a hepatitis virus. We're still zooming in, we're still zooming in, and we finally are starting to hit molecules all the way over here in picometers, right? 10 to the negative 12th. 
So glucose, which was one of our energy storage molecules um, that we talked about in populations and resources, is 900 picometers. If we keep going in, we've got a water molecule um, and an atom, a carbon atom at 340 picometers. So think about how much we had to zoom in, zoom in, zoom in um, to get to those atoms and molecules. These things are really, really small. So why do we care about seeing the atoms and the molecules that are making up our substances? Well, after looking in the digital model and reading about atoms and molecules, we realized that these atoms and molecules are the things that are actually causing these substances to have these different properties. Just like we saw in our thermal energy unit in sixth grade and our phase change unit in seventh grade, we're seeing that these tiny atoms and molecules, their movements, their types, are causing the things that we are actually able to observe at the macroscopic scale, right? And that is so crazy because we just saw how tiny these things are. Yet they are giving characteristics, they're, they're creating temperature, they're deciding what phase a substance is in. Um, and so all of this is happening on this very, very small scale, but it's causing these really big changes that we see. For example, we read about cubic zirconia versus diamonds, and these look very, very similar. One is very expensive, while the other is not. Um, and so that's why you sometimes see cubic zirconia used in jewelry to, to kind of represent a diamond. Now, they look very, very similar, but as we realized from our article, the cubic zirconia is made up of a repeating molecule or group of atoms that are oxygen and zirconium, whereas the diamond is a repeating carbon atom. And so because these things are made of these different repeating atoms or atom groups, they are actually different substances, despite sharing some properties. The diamond at the end of the day is more valuable, it's tougher, it's something that people spend a lot of money on, um, and that is due to the fact that it's made of these repeating carbon atoms. We found out that substances are made of atoms or groups of atoms that repeat. The number and types of atoms that repeat are different for different substances. Diamonds are made of just carbon atoms repeating. Cubic zirconia is a different substance because it has a different group of atoms that repeat. We realized that the way that these atoms repeat can be in two different ways. When an atom just repeats or a group of atoms repeats in a very organized and, and very clear and repetitive way, we call the structures that it forms extended structures. So notice here, um, this is gold, that it's one atom that's repeating in a very organized and specific way. Here we have sodium chloride, which is actually table salt, and the sodium and the chlorine repeating group, again, are repeating in a very predictable and organized way, versus here we still have that repeating group um, this time it's hydrogen and then oxygen, but notice how these are not connected to each other. They're repeating more randomly, um, maybe slightly spaced apart, not in this kind of organized uniform, uniform block like the extended structure. And that's what we call molecules. So that's a little bit of a differentiation between how these repeating atoms or groups make up these larger structures. So here are our key ideas about our atoms and our molecules and how they make up these different properties. Substances have these properties because they are made of these different atom groups or repeating atoms or molecules. A substance is made of many repeating atoms or repeating atom groups. So think about it, right? We just saw how tiny these things are. 
for us to be able to see everything that's around us. Like, for example, my hand. There must be so many repeating atom groups that are concentrated in one area for me to be able to see it with my eyes. And finally, we saw that the repeating atom groups can form into extended structures or into these groups called molecules. So let's have a little check-in. I want you to pause your video for a moment and think about these three samples. There are um, some samples of substances and I want you to take a look and think about, are these samples the same substance or different substances? What are you thinking? Pause the video. I would really recommend that you check in with that friend now or that family member, um, compare your ideas and explain to each other why you're thinking that and then check back in. All right, so sample one and two are actually different substances. Um, and so sample two and three are actually the same substance. Why are these atoms the same? Even though this sample only has two atoms and this has four, well, as you might notice, this repeating group is the same over here. And so sample three is just actually more of sample two. Notice how the carbon and oxygen repeat in the same exact way and pattern as in sample two. Sample one is different because the repeating group of oxygen, carbon, and another oxygen does make it a different substance. And so we saw uh, in the digital model that sometimes only one atom difference can make this completely different substance. Um, and in this case, one of the substances is poisonous to us and one of them is not. And so that, that tiny little atom, it's crazy to think about, makes this difference in the properties and the substance that it is. So we collected all of this evidence to understand more about atoms and molecules and substances because we're trying to figure out what is going on in the, the water in Westfield. At the end of our chapter one, we came back and realized that those samples that I showed you before, um, we were able to run them through a chemical analysis and get their structure. What atoms are they made up of? Here you can see the chemical structures of each of our substances. The iron pipes are made of a repeating atom of iron. The fertilizer is made of a repeating atom group that contains sodium, oxygen, and nitrogen atoms. The iron oxide, or also is known as the brown substance, is made of a repeating group of iron and oxygen atoms and our water molecules are made up of a repeating group of hydrogen and oxygen. So I know that before our break, my students gave their best thinking about what the brown substance was, whether it was the same as one of these things, whether it was a combination or where they think they thought it came from. I want you to pause the video if you haven't had a chance to think about that yet before we discuss what this brown substance is and what this evidence tells us about where it came from. Make sure you pause and think for yourself before you continue to watch the video. So this brown substance, this iron oxide is actually something called rust, which some of you guessed at the very beginning when we were sharing our initial ideas. Now, what does this really mean? Rust is something that we see all around. For example, you might have seen it on cars or metals, or in Seattle, can anybody guess what this place is? It is Gasworks Park, which is just down the street from Hamilton Middle School where I teach. So rust can be seen in many, many places. And when we see rust, that means that there are tons and tons of these repeating units of this iron oxide molecule that contains the iron and the oxygen, right? It must mean that there's many, many, many repetitions of this molecule in a collected area. Now, we realize then that 
we need to understand where this brown substance came from. And it seems that the brown substance is not likely coming from just one of these things. Um, the iron pipes is not the same thing as the rest. The fertilizer is not the same thing as the rest. The water is not the same thing as the rest. And we can tell that because they have these different repeating atoms or repeating atom groups. But then what is it? Where did it come from? That is what we are going to move on to understand. And before the closure, I asked some of my students to share their thinking with me about where it came from. Here are some of the claims that I saw. One idea was that the pipe turned into the rust. And so we see that there's this iron atom here um, and, and some were thinking that maybe the iron over time became this rust. Some were thinking that the fertilizer turned into this brown substance. Um, so perhaps these look very, very similar. Perhaps there was something that occurred that allowed the, the other atoms to turn in to these, these iron atoms and make this rust. Another idea I saw was that the fertilizer in the pipes actually combined to make this rust. And same with the water in the pipes they're combining to make this rust. So this is obviously something we need to look more into. And this is where we're going to be going in our future lessons. I know today's lesson was a little bit longer because we're recapping all we've learned so far, but our future lessons will be much shorter. I've taken your guys' feedback and know that you'd like to have a little bit of a shorter length of video. Um, and so I will make sure to try and do that in our future lessons. I'm really excited to continue learning about the Westfield problem with you um, and see what evidence we can collect to understand where this rust is coming from. In our next lesson, I will be doing an investigation. And if you have these materials at home, um, you might be able to follow along with me. So something that you might want to see if you have in your kitchen would be vinegar, baking soda, and salt. Um, these are some things that I am going to be using in my investigation. And if you have them ready for next time, maybe you will be able to, to do it along with me at home as well. I'm really excited for our next lessons. I will see you guys soon.